It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was around his waist. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do, as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Morning everyone. Today we're looking at John 13, which is entitled Jesus Washes the Disciples' Feet. It was before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And of course, we know what that means. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. The full extent of his love was demonstrated in the cross, but they at that point wouldn't have known that. I think the Apostle Paul describes it beautifully in Philippians 2, when he describes Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Verse 2. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And I think that was one of the secrets of Jesus's sense of security and serenity as he faced the challenge of going to the cross. He knew he was 100% God and 100% human. He knew he was going to glory beyond the cross and that yes, he had to face short-term humiliation and agony. And yet he knew that he was being obedient to the Father's will and that the Father would glorify him on the other side and that he would bring mankind back uh, to himself through his act on the cross. He was assured as God's beloved son. And it just makes me wonder, how assured are we? Do we rest in our assurance? Sure, we're not 100% God, but we are beloved, adopted sons and daughters who call Jesus Lord and Saviour. We have a future and a hope because of Jesus. A future in this life as citizens of the kingdom of heaven already but also in the days ahead in the years ahead 
in perhaps the centuries ahead, we don't know when Jesus will come back, but at some point we will live with him again in the new heaven and the new earth. And I suppose the question is, do we live from that place of assurance or not? Verse 4 and 5. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel round his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped round him. Now, Jesus had talked a lot about serving, but this was the point where he modelled service. And what was their response? They were horrified. They, 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 couldn't, they couldn't come to terms with the fact that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, had, had just chosen to wash their feet. This was culturally an outrageous act of servanthood, where their rabbi, their lord and master, had chosen to wash their feet. I mean, they hadn't even offered to wash Jesus' feet, which would have been more appropriate. And I just, I think for us, in a way, uh, an example of what that would possibly look like in our life would be if we were invited to uh, the gar a garden party at the palace. And when the queen greeted us, she took off her hat, she took off her coat, she grabbed one of the towels from one of the waiters, wrapped it round her frock and knelt down and washed our feet. I mean, it, it would just be amazing. It would be shattering in many respects. But Jesus here was teaching his disciples what servanthood looked like. It was unnatural but godly and of course the disciples I think at that stage were preparing themselves for natural glory and fame they'd come into Jerusalem with Jesus where he had been hailed by the crowds as as the Messiah uh, they'd waved palm branches and and in Mark 10 32 we see that John and James are asking Jesus to sit at his right and left hand in glory in the future. Now, we know, but they didn't know at the time, that Jesus' journey to glory would come through the humiliation of the cross. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not every one of you was clean. Unless I wash you, you have no part in me. And Jesus was making it quite clear that none of us could come into God's presence on our own merits, that we would only ever be able to come into the presence of God after we had been justified, that we all need to be justified. And that's what he described as the bath, the one of cleansing that would come as a result of us accepting the need for Jesus to have died and paid the penalty for our sin. That one of cleansing which changes our nature from being essentially sinful to being clean in who we are, despite the fact that we still sin on a daily basis in our thoughts, in our attitudes, in our actions. And we still need our feet to be washed on a daily basis, cleansing us from the sins that we commit regularly. Verse 6. 
verse 12 and following. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And here he is reminding them of a distinctive kingdom value, that pursuit of serving one another rather than looking for status from one another. He had previously talked about the Gentiles lording it over one another. And here he shows that that is not what the kingdom is about. The kingdom is about serving and that is powerful in winning people's hearts. And God is interested in our hearts rather than just our lip service. He wants our hearts for our sake as well as for his. And it's interesting that the Royal Military Academy of Sandhurst, in their officer training, their motto is serve to lead. They understand the power that service has. And they expand that by saying the men and women you are responsible for are your first priority in that their needs need to come before yours. Verse 16 and 17, Jesus says to his disciples, Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Why does he want us to serve rather than pursuing status? For our blessing as well as for others' blessing it makes us more like Jesus. It delights Father God and invests in heavenly treasure rather than earthly treasure. So I'd just like us to ask just a, a couple of questions at the end here. Are we secure in who we are in the way that Jesus was secure in who he was? Are we free to serve rather than to pursue status? Do we live from a place of knowing that we enjoy God's love, acceptance, favour and are his beloved children? Do we live from that place of favour rather than living for God's favour and his approval? Do we pursue service rather than status and enjoy the promised blessings of that? Remember, Jesus chose to wash the feet and to die for people who he knew would betray him, would deny him and would desert him. And I just wonder, is there someone in our family or our workplace or our street who we need to release forgiveness over to choose to serve today? Something to think about and pray about over the days ahead. Have a good Easter when it comes.